WPSU is your source for Penn State sports, Penn State research, Penn State community. But we can't do it without your support. Make a contribution today and get a DVD of your favorite Penn State show. Presentation of To the Best of My Knowledge on WPSU is made possible in part by support from the Penn State Alumni Association, informing, involving, and inspiring Penn State alumni and students through its publications, programs, and events. On the web at alumni.psu.edu. And from the members of WPSU. From the studios of Penn State Public Broadcasting, this is To the Best of My Knowledge. Good evening, I'm Patty Satalia. Tonight we'll be talking with Penn State President Graham Spanier about the state of the university. Penn State received more than 108,000 applications for admission this year, making it the number one pick among prospective students. At the same time, gifts to the university from alumni and friends totaled $182 million. In this special edition of To the Best of My Knowledge, Penn State President Graham Spanier will talk about achievements of the past year and discuss goals for the year to come. We begin tonight with President Spanier's annual State of the University video, and then he'll be back to take your calls and questions at one 800-543-8242. As always, if you'd prefer to email us, our address is response at psu.edu. I'm Graham Spanier, President of Penn State. Allow me to update you on the state of our university. As President George Atherton said, I understand full well that my path is not to be strewn with roses. But if devotion and hard work and singleness of purpose can accomplish anything, we can win. Adversity is no stranger at Penn State, and along with the rest of the nation, we've seen our share of it this past year. Yet Penn State's pioneering vision and heritage have endured and in some ways thrived despite the economic downturn. We are fortunate Penn State remains America's most popular university, receiving a record-setting 107,000 applications for admission this year. We have 93,000 students studying at our 24 campuses and through our online world campus and half a million alumni make us proud every day. I'm grateful to Penn State's 44,000 full and part-time employees who have taken on increased workloads, sacrificed salary increases, reduced expenses, and contributed in countless ways to enable us to hold down tuition increases and maintain the quality of our programs. As I begin my 15th year as president of Penn State, I feel privileged to be a part of one of the most noble of endeavors, preparing future leaders for every sector of our society. For every individual, education is much more than a personal benefit. It is a societal good that is the foundation for developing character, conscience, citizenship, and social responsibility. Penn State is changing the world, and through the example of our faculty, students, and staff, I want to show you how. Penn State ranks number one in engineering and material sciences. Penn State is second in defense-related research. We rank third nationally in industry-sponsored research. With annual research expenditures approaching $750 million, Penn State ranks among the leaders worldwide. We excel in industry-sponsored research. 
Last year, 750 companies were engaged in Penn State research partnerships, putting us at the top in the nation. Dr. Heath Hoffman, Associate Professor of Electrical Engineering, has been working on the car of the future, and it is sleek, stylish, and electric. His research into fuel efficient, sustainable, and affordable vehicles continues at Penn State with the PSU Advanced Vehicle Team and the EcoCar Competition. The Penn State Advanced Vehicle Team is a collection of undergraduate and graduate level students developing actual hybrid electric vehicles from stock conventional vehicles. Hybrid electric, electric vehicles will be a crucial part of the future energy policy of this country. So developing engineers who are capable of designing these machines is, is really uh, critical. Dr. Sridhar Ananda Krishnan conducts much of his research using another type of vehicle, a snowmobile. The work that I'm doing is understanding how the ice in Antarctica and in Greenland is changing today. Going out there and measuring its thickness, its flow speed, the stuff underneath it, and then bringing that information back and working with the numerical modelers, the computer modelers, to build better models for what the future of this massive ice looks like. The impact of the work that I do is to understand how the loss of ice in Antarctica and in Greenland will affect sea level. Dr. Nina Jablonski, professor and head of the Department of Anthropology, is helping us better understand our own skin through her research. This year she appeared on NPR, CBS Sunday Morning, The Colbert Report, and in many leading publications with Skin, a book that explores how skin works and why it is important to our day-to-day -day health and well-being. Melanin pigment protects our skin against the breakdown of particular vitamins that are essential to life and reproduction, and more of it is necessary if you live in a high ultraviolet environment, like near the equator. I see this bringing people together in new communities of understanding, and that's fantastic. An exciting example of the interdisciplinary approach to research has mammoth implications. Just consider the work of Dr. Stefan Schuster, professor of biochemistry and molecular biology, and Dr. Webb Miller, professor of biology and computer science and engineering. Their work is linked to the past, but may unlock the knowledge that will protect today's endangered species. Time Magazine recently listed both among the world's 100 most influential people. We read the genome sequence of the woolly mammoth. First time anybody had done that uh, for an extinct animal. We have pretty much opened a window to the past. It was believed that all the genetic information was lost. But by our technology, we gain access to this information again, and we can not only find up about the genetic makeup of an extinct animal, but we can also study the populations that have lived. I think really what was the breakthrough in making this project happen was it was a collaborative effort that brought together two very complementary sets of skills between two faculty. Uh, we need each other because the range of skills that you need to do this well is really huge. Collaboration extends beyond campus boundaries as well. Dr. Michael Kenney, Assistant Professor of Political Science and Public Policy at Penn State Harrisburg, is collaborating with Dr. John Horgan of Penn State's International Center for the Study of Terrorism on a project for the Office of Naval Research. The study of terrorism by its very nature is multidisciplinary. Um, no one academic discipline can possibly have the monopoly over the study of terrorism. If you want to understand how terrorists think, adapt, learn and change, we have no choice but to go into the field and speak to people who have been involved in terrorism. This research seeks to paint a clearer picture of the adversary in order to better inform counterterrorism policy. Each one of us has expertise in a different yet overlapping area. I've always been a firm believer that if you want to do the best possible job, you have to bring together the best possible team, and I'm convinced that we've done that for this project. We scheduled 3,689 final exams at University Park alone. Last year, the faculty taught 30,669 class sections. 
and awarded 18,326 degrees university-wide. And 2.5 million ice cream cones were eaten. After all those classes, everyone needs a treat. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good day. Good stuff. Penn State faculty members are making an impact on the world one student at a time. At Penn State School of International Affairs, Dr. Tianjana Malua is helping prepare graduate students to take leadership positions in the increasingly interconnected and global society. His experience as legal advisor to the office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights provides a unique perspective on the challenges faced around the world. Our primary interest is in training students to understand the imperatives and the qualities of leadership from an international perspective. We have quite a number of students who are doing internships in other countries. We have a student in Israel uh, working with uh, communities in a kibbutz. We have a student in Germany who is working with an institute that deals with uh, security issues. And we have a student right here in the United States who is working with peacekeeping operations. Penn State has always been in the forefront of producing leaders. And I think the School of International Affairs can only contribute to the production of more leaders as we go along. At Penn State Brandywine, distinguished professor of political science, Dr. Stephen Simbala, is helping shape the fields of international security studies, defense policy, and intelligence. I have two main goals for my students. I want them to be able to connect dots across different kinds of readings, different kinds of concepts. The second thing would be, uh, I hope students come out of my classes feeling a sense of a more responsible citizenship, more willing to vote, to take part in the political process, to join a political party, to campaign, or running for Congress. You know, wouldn't that be wonderful? We are number one for website hits on Google, Yahoo, and Ask. We are ranked number one in video search results for YouTube, Google Video, and Yahoo. And we're number one on social networking sites like Facebook and Twitter. Technology has changed the way we teach, learn, work, communicate, and connect. Dr. Janice Light, Distinguished Professor of Communication Sciences and Disorders at Penn State, is using technology to help disabled children learn to communicate. Imagine for a moment if you were unable to speak, unable to communicate with others. You would have incredible frustration, really be locked in, unable to connect with others. This is the experience for many of the children who come to us who have special needs. We've worked with some children as young as six months old, and we've introduced them to assistive technology, and they've developed the foundations of language, learned to read and write and type, and in fact, they've entered school as readers and writers well ahead of their typically developing peers because of the early intervention using assistive technologies. One, two. When we start working with Dr. Light, and it started to come out, things just started clicking and it was communicating more. Dr. Light has given us hope. She really opened up Anna's mind and opened up Anna's willingness to learn. Um, spell Toby. We see a brighter future for Anna. We're very grateful for uh, the hope that Penn State has given us for our daughter. At Penn State Fayette, nursing students work in the new state-of-the-art biomedical technology building. Enrollment in Penn State's undergraduate nursing program has increased 20% over the last four years. And at University Park, our graduate program has more than doubled in size. Nurses are in the prime position to make changes locally, globally. So we're here to focus people in the right direction to maintain their current health status and hopefully improve it for long duration. Penn State is the largest single contributor to Pennsylvania's economy. Penn State's economic impact on Pennsylvania, $17 billion. With 44,000 full and part-time employees, Penn State is the largest non-governmental employer in Pennsylvania. Universities like ours struggle with balance. 
How do we maintain the momentum of a leading research institution and continue to reach out to the people of the Commonwealth without sacrificing our primary mission of educating our students? We continue to have as a goal being the leading university in the integration of teaching, research, and service. And at the same time, we recognize our position as the single largest contributor to the state's economy. Consider the economic impact of research by Penn State scholars studying the Marcellus Shale in the Appalachian Basin. Pennsylvania is incredibly blessed in having a gas shale called the Marcellus that is thick, extensive throughout the state, and at the right depth of burial and thermal maturity for gas production. My research on the Marcellus had the immediate impact of taking the value of a lease from $100 almost immediately up to $2,500 an acre. So we're going to talk about the, the geology, like I said, and talk about this Marcellus shale. The value of education in this process is absolutely huge. So a lot of new capacity is being built. After the educational process from Penn State, we've been able to generate about an extra uh, $200 million in the difference between what their first offers were and what the final outcome was with the leases. Penn State has a lot to offer to develop more of that resource and keep more of those energy dollars, uh, number one here in the United States and more importantly here in Pennsylvania. Human development is another Penn State priority. We offer a wide range of university-based activities that include 4-H, summer sports camps, and arts and cultural events. From new acquisitions at the Palmer Museum of Art to a historic performance with artists Emmanuel Axe, Itzhak Perlman, and Yo-Yo Ma, to the Penn State Laureate Program, the arts bring us together and enrich our lives. Each year, these Penn State activities attract nearly one million visitors and generate $1.73 billion for the state's economy. And when you get that many Nittany Lions together, you can hear the roar. Penn State has earned 63 national team championships, including six in the last two years. In the last 15 years, 3,312 student athletes have earned academic All Big Ten honors, including me, Stefan Wisniewski. Attendance at Beaver Stadium since 1960 is over 23 million. And there's still only one cheer. Last year, Penn State teams shook the stands at stadiums and arenas from coast to coast. Our intercollegiate teams had a remarkable year for titles and trophies. Our NCAA champion women's volleyball team was called a perfect Penn State Nittany Lion team. Our men's basketball team won the National Invitational Tournament and set a school record for victories. And the men's and women's fencing team won their 11th NCAA championship. Our scholar athletes have given us another reason to be proud, academics. Nittany Lions student athletes are among the leaders nationally for their excellence in the classroom. When you do well in the classroom, it makes you feel better about going into practice or going into a game. Feeling good about the stuff that you've done off the court definitely carries over onto what you're doing on the court. Penn State students have donated five million hours of service throughout the Commonwealth. Through hundreds of student service organizations university-wide. While the 4,555 members of the fraternity and sorority community contributed their time and talent to a wide range of philanthropic causes. And Penn State employees have contributed $130 million annually in donations and volunteer services. Penn State's first president, Evan Pugh, called Penn State the people's institution. And that commitment to society is evident today. The Lady Lions have a strong commitment to community service. And it's really important that we do everything that we can to get out and, and touch people. 
really getting out and building relationships with people, building relationships with organizations so that they understand that the Lady Lion basketball program really wants to have an impact. They support us, we support them, and it's a family. That's the Penn State way. Penn State is consistently among the leading universities sending its graduates to the Peace Corps, AmeriCorps, and Teach for America. In addition, Penn State students serve others locally and globally through hundreds of clubs, organizations, and activities. Service also plays a key role in Penn State's highly ranked supply chain program. The United States Marine Corps has turned to Penn State to lead the Marine Corps Logistics Education Program. Our key role in these programs is to bring ideas and, and concepts that they may not have been exposed to, particularly logistics and supply chain experience from the commercial sector. Things have changed in the way we fight wars, and it's much more akin to what's happening in the private sector, that speed to get there and make it happen. They're able to, one, deploy much faster than they were before, and secondly, when they're on the battlefield, they're able to support those troops better than they ever have before. It's a really proud thing for us to be able to participate in this program. THON is the largest student-run philanthropy in the world. We've raised over $775 million for For the Future, a campaign for Penn State students. We have the largest alumni association in the world, and we're number one in the number of alumni donors. 75% of undergrad students last year received financial aid to help pay for their education at Penn State. And for that, we have just two words. Thank you. To help address the challenges of affordability and accessibility, we are pursuing our most ambitious fundraising campaign in Penn State history. For the future, the campaign for Penn State students. At the heart of this campaign is the priority to make Penn State the top student-centered research university in America. Despite the current economic climate, Penn State's alumni and friends are continuing to support the university enthusiastically. Our supporters have built state-of-the-art facilities and programs, created new scholarships, fellowships, professorships, and faculty chairs, and have invested in research, technology, and outreach. Such giving is testimony to the loyalty and generosity of Penn Staters. We find Penn Staters everywhere. We find them in science, we find them in the arts, we find them in entertainment. Penn State faculty work in so many areas that contribute to making life better for people in Pennsylvania, for people throughout the world. Penn State can change the world uh, through advanced research, through outreach, through creating new technologies, and to help educate the next generation. It's the people. I mean, it's just a, it's a great place to work. Uh, the people are, you know, just a great family. And it's not just, you know, the hundred student service organizations or the millions of dollars that are raised. There are individual students doing small deeds every day, one hour, one dollar, one vote, one person at a time. And I think that collectively is how Penn State changes the world. Penn State provides us with a wonderful set of resources, brings together a great set of folks, and together we can really make an impact. We are worldwide. We change the world because of our size and scale, but more importantly, we change the world by changing individual lives for the better, and that's what we do best. Whether it's in government, whether it's in science, whether it's just somebody who's trying to help some other people do a better job, so we've had a tremendous, tremendous impact on the world, and then we're getting better all the time. 154 years since our founding, 100 words in the Penn State alma mater. One mascot. One mission. One university. While this has been a year of challenges, it has also brought out the best in the Penn State community. Educational excellence, research and scholarship, dedicated service. We are changing the world. We are Penn State.
Wow. When you see it laid out that way and, and you take stock in, in the past year, the accomplishments of Penn State, my guess is that you have to watch that uh, as many times as you had uh, uh, and be inspired. I'm very proud uh, of so many things that happened at this university, including public broadcasting, uh, which we didn't even mention in there. And your colleagues here at WPSU had a role in helping us uh, put that together. It, uh, it is something we can be very proud of. More than 20,000 people have watched that video to date. Give us an idea of the kind of feedback you're getting. Well, you know, a, a few years ago, uh, and for most of my years as president of Penn State, I would go to Eisenhower Auditorium and we'd give a lecture for a couple thousand people. We put it up on satellite for faculty and staff around the state. But we decided ab about three years ago to go to this video format. And so instead of a couple of thousand people seeing it, now tens of thousands of people see it each year and as you said just in the short time since we first shown it already 20,000 people have logged in to to take a look and there's so much that we can share and and be proud of and uh, we we owe it to a lot of people to give them a report on the state of the university so I, I think it's been a good approach now you started this video talking about adversity and mm -hmm. and the state has still not passed a, a budget which means that you started this school year without the more than 83 million dollars that would be uh, uh, you would normally have by now what impact what are the implications of starting a school year in that position well it's a real challenge for us because we're making certain assumptions that we will end up having a budget that's in the range that we've hoped for and predicted uh, at this moment, we're, uh, as you mentioned, $83.6 million short of what we would have expected by now. That puts a burden on us because we either have to use up our reserves, our liquidity, our cash flow to pay the bills, or we have to go out at some point and start borrowing money until the state budget gets done. I think we're the only state left that still doesn't have a budget, and I know they're in Harrisburg working away on it, but it does create uh, quite a bit of uncertainty for us. Well, last year, Penn State's appropriation was uh, cut 6%, mm -hmm. and, and this year, Governor Rendell talked not only about uh, cutting state support to, uh, to, uh, to Penn State, but also excluding Penn State from the state's application for federal stimulus money, um, mm -hmm. although the Department of Education intervened. But I'm wondering, realistically, what are you hoping to get this year from the state, and how important is it? Well, it was a bit of a shock when that proposal uh, was put on the table, uh, and I know the, the state is, is struggling, just like the university and like a lot of households, and uh, we did get the, the federal government to agree that Penn State had to be considered a public university or entitled uh, to public funding. So the stimulus funding at the federal level does call for universities like ours to uh, be held harmless for cuts. We don't expect any additional money and we hope to get that 6% restored. But uh, we are, are looking not only at the challenges this year, but when the stimulus money that's been used to plug the gap runs out in a year or two, then uh, we're going to continue to to have to face up to these difficult questions of the long-term financing of the university. This year we took a risk and we went with uh, the lowest tuition increase in modern history, hoping that we would get a reasonable appropriation. And uh, the worst thing that could happen is, is if we have to unduly raise tuition for students and their families that are struggling. So uh, the single largest item in a university's budget is uh, salaries. We are a very people intensive business and this year these 44,000 employees of the university made a tremendous sacrifice by not taking a salary increase. Nobody. Salary uh, freezes all around. You've done some unusual things to uh, uh, to sort of temper what's happening, some creative moves. Penn State asked parents of, of some of the some of the students who are in the prestigious uh, Schreier Honors College to donate back the $3,500 scholarship money uh, that they get. How's that working out? <laughs> well, that was one of the more creative <laughs> ideas, and, uh, you know, you wouldn't necessarily think it would work, but, hey, guess what? A lot of people did say uh, those are merit scholarships, and we're very pleased that our child is so good that he or she got a merit scholarship, but we probably don't need the money as well as uh, as much as some other people do. And so they 
donated the scholarship back, which is incredible. And I think there were a couple hundred thousand dollars that came back to us that way that could be reallocated to other students who do have genuine financial need. It, it, it's, I don't know if you'd see that at any other university. May, maybe, but I, I, I'm so proud of the fact that it happened at Penn State. Now, you talked a moment ago about uh, in the early days, your uh, State of the University address was held at Eisenhower Auditorium, and I remember the one that you gave in 1995, and you said something in that address that I won't forget, and I quote you here, only education could allow a poor immigrant who grew up on the south side of Chicago to become the president of Penn State. Uh, now, I want to say that most people don't know that you were born in, in Cape Town, uh, South Africa, that your father fled South, uh, South Africa uh, to escape Nazi Germany. They don't know that you're the first member of your family to get a college education. And, and I have to ask, do you believe, as you must have then, that, that the value of a college education is, is something that you can't really even put your hands on? Well, I believed it then because I experienced it. And I believe it even more today because now, after 14 years as president of Penn State and having my name on the diploma of tens of thousands of, of students since I came here, uh, I've been here long enough that I can already see the careers unfolding, the lives unfolding, the marriages and families unfolding of so many of these graduates that I got to know along the way. And it, it, it only happens because of education. It, it's, it's a very powerful force. And I'm glad we live in a country where we value it and where we support it and where the taxpayers uh, and families, uh, among others, uh, are willing to put money into it. We mentioned uh, philanthropy, and you did in your opening uh, uh, comments. And uh, so far, we're nearly $800 million into a very large capital campaign. And so it's not just the families and the, and the taxpayers, but it's our alumni, it's, it's donors who are giving money to the university. And this, the single thing they give it for the most is scholarships so that other students can have this opportunity. Now, you said uh, in this video that Penn State is the largest contributor to Pennsylvania's economy. I think it might be interesting to note that the American Institute for Economic Research recently ranked State College as the second best college town in the U.S. My guess is you're not a whole, uh, whole lot surprised by that. In almost every survey, we show up somewhere in the top 10 of livable places, retirement destinations. I can hardly believe we came in second in this survey. I don't know what was so great about Ithaca, New York, but they, <laughs> they landed up ahead of us in, uh, in that one. But it, it, it is a, it's a great place to live. It's a great place uh, to raise a family. W when we do a search for a new position, we have lots of applicants, and um, we, we're able to hire good people here and, and retain them here. So, uh, yeah, State College is, is good, but, uh, you know, we have 23 other campuses around the state, and many of them are similarly situated in outstanding community. So our students like being there, the employees like being there, and if you take these 24 campuses together and all of the other Penn State-related enterprises, uh, it's a $17 billion impact on the economy that has uh, come out of a study by an independent firm that that, that looks at uh, impact on economic development. So a good return on money yes, for the state. If you're just tuning in, I'm Patty Satalia with Penn State President Graham Spanier, and we're talking about his annual State of the University Address to the Commonwealth. That address was produced in high-definition video. If you didn't see it or care to watch it again, go to this address. It's president.psu.edu front slash SOU. Click through to the 2009 address where you'll find the video as well as the transcript. And in the meantime, if you have comments or questions for the president, he'd be happy to talk with you. Our toll-free number is 1-800-543-8242, or you may email us at response at psu.edu. Now, anyone who has watched these videos uh, uh, last year and, and the year before know that last year you focused on the physical plant. We saw a lot in that video about uh, major developments in terms of construction at Penn State. This one really focused on Penn State fact. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the thinking behind what you present and, and uh, why. 
Well, there's no magic formula. Each year we have to look broadly around the university and think, what, what is it time to talk about now? Uh, we did have a lot of development with facilities in recent years, and so that was a good thing to feature uh, last year. Now we're actually slowing down a little bit on the physical plant side, uh, not because we care less about the facilities, but as money is tighter, it's harder to find the funds to build the new buildings. And we are in an era, frankly, at Penn State where we're putting a little more emphasis on the renovation of existing facilities than on building new buildings. Now there'll always be a couple of new buildings under construction because uh, we have an aging campus and science evolves and and uh, as research grants and contracts increase and the student population increases a little bit in size, you do need uh, some more facilities. But fundamentally, a university like ours is about people. About 70% of our budget is in salary and benefits of people. And people come to a, a university, oh, in part because of the environment and what it looks like, but also because of the people they're going to be uh, associated with. So. Uh, we thought, yeah, let, let's feature the, the people this year. And uh, we, we always do to some extent, but we did put a, a special emphasis, as, as a, uh, you noticed uh, in the video this year, on, on our people. All right. When, uh, speaking of people, we have our first caller, Matthew Moyer, is joining us from Hershey, Pennsylvania. Matthew, go ahead, please. President Spanier, I was hoping uh, you could fill us in on the status of the medical school, and specifically the medical center. And maybe a little bit about the cancer center. How does that impact PA at this point? I know that a Absolutely. lot of people at Penn State are very excited about it. Well, if you take the entirety of Penn State, the single largest enterprise uh, attached to the university is the Milton S. Hershey Medical Center, the Penn State Medical Center uh, there in Hershey near where you are. We have about 8,000 of our Penn State employees there and the activities at the medical center and the clinical side and the medical school side are now more than 30 percent uh, of the overall Penn State budget. The newest development there and we're just thrilled with it is the opening of the new cancer center. This is an incredible advance for central Pennsylvania. People no longer have to travel hundreds of miles to get the highest quality care and state-of-the-art facilities. The next project that we are developing, and it's on the drawing boards, and, and we hope not too far off, will be a new children's hospital. We're out there raising money for this children's hospital from uh, all kinds of, of sources. And I, I hope that uh, during the course of this year, we will be able to move through with approvals for the children's hospital get that under construction. That will, by the way, in turn lead to some new additional jobs for central Pennsylvania. And again, like the case of the Cancer Center, will provide uh, for an, an a absolutely a tremendous advance in, in the quality of care and allowing children to have the, the best fo possible facility uh, for their needs. So uh, great things are happening there in Hershey, and thank you for asking about it. Very good. Well, thanks for taking my call. You bet. Thank you. I think one of the uh, probably the most gratifying things for you, having been here 14 years, beginning your 15 year as president, is that you have embarked on things that take time to happen. And one of the things that comes to mind is is Penn State's Dickinson School of Law. Mm -hmm. That was an idea that took years to uh, to come to fruition, and now it's the nation's only fully approved uh, two location law school. What does that mean to Penn State and to the Commonwealth? Why do you think that's an important advance? Well, I think it's one of the great things that's uh, happened at the university. Uh, 1997, uh, 12 years ago, is when we uh, first came together. And now we've evolved to the point where we have a brand new, beautiful, state-of-the-art building on the University Park campus and a facility in Carlisle that captures the historical facility there but has remodeled it and has expanded and put an addition uh, onto that law school. So we are, as you mentioned, a two-location law school. Uh, it required us to go to the American Bar Association to say we want to do something very unique and very different here. They had to change the rules a little bit to accommodate us. And the consequence of this has been that we have attracted some of the most amazing legal scholars from around the United States and from around the world, in, in fact, to come to Penn State at Carlisle or, or University Park. 
we have the opportunity for our students to move back and forth. They can be at either campus. All of our classes are uh, offered in, in both places electronically. And the, the uh, information technology around this is, is so impressive that we could be in different cities but feel that it is this close. It's, uh, it's a remark remarkable thing and I love for people to come and visit. We also started a new School of International Affairs which administratively is attached to the law school and is located in the same building even though that's a broader uh, multidisciplinary uh, program. So between the School of International Affairs and the law school we, we have we're on the cutting edge now of uh, legal education and, and international education. We, from last year to this year, saw a 51 percent increase in applications to the Dickinson School of Law and we moved way, way up in all of the rankings. We're talking about world's, uh, world leaders, uh, legal experts, but also really highly credentialed students who are attracted to this new program. The qualifications of the new students uh, has gone up and, and you might expect that because with this incredible dramatic rise in applications, you tend to pick the best students to come into the law school. So we're, we are getting uh, exceptionally good students and that's going to be good for them later on. As the stature of the law school increases, the value of the Penn State degree increases, the more law firms and others will want to hire Penn State law graduates and the more faculty will want to be associated with a program like that. It's interesting though because the School of International Affairs, that's something you, that you would expect in a, a university that's located in a city. Georgetown, Johns mm -hmm. Hopkins University, Columbia, not Penn State, not Central Pennsylvania or Carlisle. I, I think that's, that's probably right, but we felt that it was something of a, of a missing link at Penn State. We we're becoming increasingly an international university. We have over 4,000 international students now. Our faculty are very diversified. We have more students studying abroad. Uh, we, we have these advances in legal education and in so many of our programs in the College of the Liberal Arts, really across the university. And I, I felt that, that Penn State could do a, a phenomenal job in the international affairs arena and in, indeed I, I think we're off and running there as people saw in the video just just a little taste of that. Students are coming from I think 131 different countries I'm reading. Where are they predominantly coming from and what's the attraction of Penn State? The largest concentration of international students are from the Asian countries. China would be first. Uh, you have uh, Taiwan, India, Turkey, Korea. Uh, to mention some of them. There's a very, very strong interest in all American research universities from the Asian countries. I think uh, eight of the top ten countries that provide students to Penn State are in the Asian region of the world. Mexico and Canada would would be the other two in, in the top ten. Uh, we welcome this diversity at the university and one of the trends that we've seen this fall is that a larger proportion of the new international students are undergraduates. In the past, they were predominantly graduate students. 30 percent in the graduate programs, I and, think. And this year, I think now over half of the incoming international students are undergraduates. And that's due, I'm sure, in part to the fact that now in their countries, their economies have approved and they can actually afford out-of-state tuition at Penn State. We love them for that reason, too, <laughs> because it, it helps us with, with the budget. But also it's a great thing because it enhances uh, the diversity. I mean, imagine if you're a kid growing up in rural Pennsylvania and, and now you have a, uh, a roommate from Singapore or from Europe or from Africa. It's, it's a very broadening experience and it, it brings an interesting perspective into discussions in the classroom. And so many of the problems that, that Penn State graduates are going to be dealing with are international problems. They aren't problems that can just be solved in Pennsylvania or just in the United States, for example. Yes, it, it's, um, it, it's great for people to have that kind of exposure and you know, it's in college when you make lifelong friends. These connections persist. I, I took a group of students over the last spring break on a, a tour it was our, our musical theater students and we went to four uh, of the major cities in Asia. Everywhere we went, we had huge numbers of Penn State alumni and large numbers of students who wanted to come to Penn State. 
Uh, they performed, we met with alumni, we did a little fundraising, and it's amazing to see how the distances feel like they're shrinking because of the information technologies that are out there and because we have so much movement between countries now uh, for so many reasons. Well, we've talked about and we've seen from the video uh, lots of accomplishments from the last year, but I'm wondering what the key challenges for Penn State are as, as we go forward here. Well, I think uh, people would expect me to talk about the budget first when you talk about challenges. Really, that's not at the top of my list. At the top of my list uh, is something I referenced in the, the video, which is uh, the issue of character, conscience, social responsibility, citizenship among our students. Uh, some of our students might not like to see it characterized this way, but uh, we have it at our university, and I feel responsibility for tens of thousands of students who frankly are in a transition from adolescence to adulthood. And in that transition, a lot of stuff goes down, a lot of things can happen, a lot of challenges for growing up and being independent, being on your own. And th that's, that's always gonna be a big issue at our uni university. You know, a lot of people had thought that the era of student affairs was sort of fading away. You didn't need student affairs. We need the student affairs division of the university more than ever. Uh, more students need health services. More students are sexually active by the time they arrive at the university. Alcohol abuse, drug use, um, sexual assaults, uh, the need for counseling services in our university. Students come to the university and many of them are already taking medication for various uh, uh, various uh, circumstances uh, th th and that many they, of the mental health have. issues uh, yes emotionally psychologically many of them arrive on campus and want to know if there's a therapy group group available this is the reality of our times half of the students who arrive at a university today have spent at least part of their childhood in a, a, a home with only one parent and they've had to deal with with uh, familial issues. So I would put that at the top of the list. Then you get into things like budget and facilities and the fact that we have a tremendous amount of deferred maintenance at the university because we have been around 154 years and we have a bunch of buildings that are almost that old and need a lot of attention. And uh, so yeah, there's, there's a lot to, uh, to think about and, and to deal with, but those are some of the, some of the things that I, I worry about. You alluded to really this perennial uh, uh, challenge uh, of underage drinking. And, and as you know, there are uh, college and university presidents around the country who are lobbying legislators to uh, lower the drinking age from 21 to 18. You are not among the presidents who favor that. Why not? <laughs> well, I was approached and asked to sign on to that initiative and uh, I, I chose not to because first of all I don't see any compelling evidence that that would improve the situation. Uh, if anything there, there was one little time in our history where for a short time the drinking age was lowered uh, and it didn't last long. The automobile deaths that were alcohol related uh, among teenagers skyrocketed uh, during that time. I, I, so I didn't feel there was any evidence and I, I didn't think it was was right for me to do that uh, because it would be sending a signal that that was just the opposite of, of how I felt about it. All right, we have another phone call from a Wendy who's calling us from Hershey. Wendy, go ahead, please. Hi, President Spanier. Um, well, your previous caller had mentioned the Premier Cancer Center that's opening at Hershey Medical Center, mm -hmm. and uh, you had mentioned the plans for the Children's Hospital. I was wondering, uh, it's, it's clear that uh, Penn State Hershey Medical Center is, is a quality care center, uh, but wondering what role does Hershey Medical Center play uh, as a Penn State hospital in State College? Uh, it doesn't seem that there's a real strong presence there by the Penn State Hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, Geisinger, however, I, I've noticed is really trying to kind of move into town. Um, what role do you see for Penn State Hershey Med Center in State College? Well, I think what you describe uh, historically has, has been the case, but uh, 
you, you will begin to see that change because we actually are right in the midst of plans to significantly enhance the presence of Penn State's College of Medicine and clinical services in the, this area. First of all, there's a little more going on here than people might realize. We have a, a whole Penn State Sports Medicine Unit, which uh, includes a, a very large staff of, of physicians, uh, physical therapists, they work with trainers in all of our different sports. They not only take care of our 850 student athletes, but thousands of other uh, people who, who need medical care in the area. We have a, a Penn State family medicine. We have a, just a, a, a wonderful high-level group of physicians working in the area of family medicine, and they are broadening their services and just recently opened up urgent care uh, a clinic where people can come in in the evenings and on Saturdays and receive care. All of that is going to be expanding. There will be additional physicians. We, we expect overall to have a, a growing president, a presence of our College of Medicine here with a hospitalist program, residency program, students in their third and fourth year of medical school who will rotate through this area. So uh, this is a uh, uh, been one aspect of, uh, of my agenda uh, and of the agenda of our uh, CEO at Hershey, our Senior Vice President for Health Affairs, Dr. Hal Paz. We're both very excited about being able to have Penn State play a greater role in providing the growing need for medical services in this area here in, uh, in the State College region. And of course there are collaborations between Hershey and Mount Nittany Medical Center. The cath lab would be one example of that. Yes, there's already a, a, a very good partnership and a whole uh, range of, of collaboration, uh, including in the area we were talking about er, uh, earlier in, in the cancer area would be one, one very good example. So we have a great foundation upon which to grow that, that partnership. And, you know, after all, the, the single largest concentration of our employees is right here in the State College area. And uh, Penn State is, is an employer that tries to keep up with uh, health benefits and excellent medical services for our own employees. So, you know, we know as well as anyone that uh, we need more doctors <laughs> in the area and more nurses and, and other support staff to help make this all go. Okay, we go now to uh, Joan, who's calling us from Clearfield. Go ahead, please, Joan. Yeah, hi. Uh, good evening. Um, good evening. Um, it's good to hear from you. Thank you. Um, I have a question. I'm a history major. And I would like to know what would the possibilities be of not just offering Native American history courses, but possibly a Native American history as a major in the future? Uh, I can't give you a specific answer to that because uh, I'm not really up to date on, on all of the different uh, array of course offerings at, at this point. I know that in our College of Education, we have uh, a Native American uh, research center and program that's been very successful. I know that we have uh, uh, some number of Native American students and we celebrate some of the customs on campus through powwows. Uh, it would be interesting to see what the demand would be for increased coursework in that area. We're very careful now about adding uh, new additional programs uh, in 2009 and beyond uh, for budgetary reasons, but if a demand were to be there uh, it's, of course, something that we would look at. Thank you for your call. Uh, you mentioned in your last answer to, to our caller, uh, Penn State athletes, mm -hmm. and I don't know how many people are aware that you chair the NCAA's Presidential Task Force on Commercial Activity in Intercollegiate Sports, uh, Athletics rather, and I'm wondering, what do you think is the key to maintaining a healthy balance between sports and, and specifically the commercialization of sports and academics? How, how hard is that? Hmm. Well, it's hard. It's all about balance. At, at Penn State, we operate intercollegiate athletics on a completely self-support basis financially. So our athletic director has a huge enterprise, a lot of employees, a lot of student athletes, and uh, he has to make it work. I'm in the fortunate position as president of Penn State that I don't ever have to steal money from the academic budget and send it to athletics. And there are only a few universities that, that can say that. So uh, there is a bit of a commercialization that has crept into college athletics. Now, it's nothing new. Back with the advent of TV and putting college sports on TV, there were commercials. 
Now, of course, you see sponsors up on the scoreboards and, and there are other areas uh, surrounding athletics where we try to create revenue streams. We need to continue to do that and we're always wary of, uh, of crossing certain lines that just don't feel right and that, that indeed uh, is, is what we were looking at in this task force that I chaired. That's just one of uh, many task forces that, uh, that you're involved in. You're a national leader in higher education. You chair the National Security Higher Education Advisory Board. You're a member of the National Counterintelligence Working Group, a member of the Board of Advisors of the Naval Postgraduate School. You serve on the Board of Junior Achievement Worldwide. Why is that involvement, when you're, when you're busy with so much on this camp, campus, <laughs> why is that important? What, do we, well, what does Penn State yeah, get as a result? Uh, some days I wonder if I'm <laughs> doing too many things, but um, all of those things uh, I feel are important for me, for Penn State, for our country, and uh, it, it's something that uh, I think benefits the university because it opens up doors, it gives us contacts, we meet other people, we make connections, and uh, for me it's personally rewarding and keeps me interested in a lot of different things. And in just a couple of seconds, where are you going to focus your energies in, in this year? Well, uh, in the same place I've always focused them, putting students first. That is the top of our agenda. And for me, that's the most fun part of the job is doing stuff with students. Tonight's program will be stored in an electronic archive that can be accessed through WPSU.org. This site also links to online resources on tonight's topic, including a link to watch the State of the University address or to download the transcript. Thank you for your calls and questions, and we hope you'll join Dr. Spanier for his next edition of To the Best of My Knowledge on October 20th. His topic is the H1N1 virus. To the Best of My Knowledge is a production of Penn State Public Broadcasting. For all of us here, at WPSU. I'm Patty Satalia with Dr. Spanier. Thanks so much for tuning in. Have a good night. Presentation of To the Best of My Knowledge on WPSU is made possible in part by support from the Penn State Alumni Association, informing, involving, and inspiring Penn State alumni and students through its publications, programs, and events. On the web at alumni.psu.edu. And from the members of WPSU. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.